we are, uh, I'm focusing on Cuba and Mitra is focusing on Cuba. And I believe that Lorena is focusing on Bogota. Bogota. And then we have um, somebody coming in via Zoom to talk about the bigger picture and a bigger project at UC Berkeley. So thank you again for coming. We're looking forward to the discussion afterwards and hearing all of the knowledge that you have about Latin America and about bicycling around the world. Mine is very much about Cuba and I'm going to, f I'm going to really try to read my PowerPoints because otherwise we'll be here too long. And if you have questions afterward, then just let me know. So the main points are in bold. So you don't have to be able to read the whole PowerPoint. Plus they're available, the session's recorded and so forth. So I w in order to better understand bicycling in Cuba, I wanted to give four basics about Cuba to kind of set the groundwork. And the first one is against the myth that Cuba is insular or isolated. Actually, uh, Cuba is internationally and transnationally connected and Havana is particularly cosmopolitan. Examples are indigenous groups that had connections to nearby lands, colonial and trade relations starting minimum with Columbus, but then going through to the US, uh, Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, left-leaning Latin America, and always, always, always relations with the United States. Also diasporic Cuban communities abroad and international travel by Cubans influence how people think in Havana. There's also strong, I'll call it non-provincial education system in Cuba, which means that Cuba learns a lot, uh, Cubans learn a lot about other countries. And I think that this myth of Cuba as insular or isolated comes from the fact that US citizens are isolated from Cuba because of the embargo that stops us from uh, being involved. It's not the other way around. But you can show up in Cuba, the Cubans will be happy to see you. The second myth is Cuba is a country frozen in time, so quite a colonialist idea that's very, however, widespread. In fact, our entire planet lives time simultaneously, and the way that we're living now is related to the so-called underdevelopment in other countries. I see nods from our super educated audience. And I'll, I'll give you the example of Cuba's vintage cars, you know, the 50s cars. They're on the streets for current material reasons, and those include the expense of importing new cars, the US embargo, Cuba's weather, like California's weather, limited alternative transportation such as bicycles and buses, especially since 1990, the special period. Then other material reasons include the skilled labor of mechanics who make a living repairing and using these cars, often as taxi drivers. Taxi drivers tend to be mechanics at the same time. And myth uh, three, Cuba is backward, or uh, myth basic three, since 1959, Cuban governance policies have focused on creating value-added exports and import substitution. So we probably know about Cuba as exporting sugarcane uh, or sugar, coffee. But Cuba exports the value-added skills of professionals such as engineers and doctors. The Henry Reed Brigade, for example, went to Lombardy as example. Uh, also, rather than importing vaccines, this is what I've been working on right now, so I encourage you to look at the articles that are in the sources. Cuba developed vaccines themselves, vaccinated their population, and Cuba is now exporting vaccines at low cost and as donations, for example, to Syria. These vaccines deploy trusted sub pro subunit protein technology. The US equivalent is Corbivax, which just came out many months after the Cuban one was already being used on children. And that's a problem of the pharma industry because that was uh, from a university rather than from big pharma. But I digress, so you could read the article. The important thing here is that those vaccines are robust and they're over 92% effective and they're cheap. So Cuba basically, um, it saved itself through import substitution. Basic four, Cuba is a middle income country. There is a severe shortage of most consumer goods, including bicycles and parts for bicycles, salient for our discussion today, in part because of the embargo and international trade relations that are related to that. But at the same time, other elements of life are free or subsidized, for example, housing, food, transportation, and education, of course, famously. So now that we have that sort of basic that I wanted to start with, uh, we'll talk a bit about bicycling in Havana in the past. So the bicycle as recreation, that was the, t uh, that was the main use of the bicycle 
uh, back in the day, as in Europe and in the United States. Bicycling in Cuba was initially a gentleman's pastime. Bicycles were expensive, for example, and there were also bike clubs that were for people that were that that um, were racialized as white and people who were racialized as people of color or black. And women struggled to gain the right to ride just as many places in the United States. So the fear of, you know, bicycle face and you're going to be so ugly. and Wow, we have to be afraid of the emancipated woman on the bike. That was also part of Cuba. W from prohibition onwards in the United States, cars became imp increasingly important in Cuba because they were part of the drinking, gambling, sex work, vacation, getaway mystique of the U.S. playground. With the revolution in 1959 came critique of Cubans, Cuba's addiction to U.S. cars, part, partly because of price. However, with the Soviet alignment, which already started in the early 60s, the motorized transit that represented modernity at the time, and still does, returned. Motorized transportation was imported from Comic-Con countries, and f famously, Lada's still, still roam the streets. The special period in the time of peace started in 1990 when the Soviet Union crashed, and so there was no more petroleum products, really, and th a solution needed to be found to transportation. So over a million bicycles were imported from China. The purchase price was subsidized to the people who were buying, and, the in and infrastructure, most importantly, infrastructure also was developed for bicycling. So the distribution happened through schools and workplaces, and people who may have never ridden before started riding. There were lots of funny stories in the newspaper about like crashes and stuff and the trying to teach people to ride safely because everybody's starting at the same time. Cuba developed bicycle lanes. They privileged the bicycle in so many ways, included guarded parking and repair stations. So it was a uh, real boom and blossoming of bicycling in the 90s. However, bicycling came to be psychologically connected to suffering because this period was so difficult. So imagine pedaling a heavy bicycle for a long distance under the hot sun to take care of all kinds of things uh, that uh, maybe could have been facilitated in a different way after maybe having uh, sh sugar water for breakfast. So as the economy improved, motorized transit was reintroduced, notably with imported Chinese buses. And the bicycle fell into disuse because subsidized buses were again available and because bicycles had come to be associated with privation and most importantly because the infrastructure started to fall away. Sturdy bicycles were not available at low cost, that is subsidized. Parts were not available because they were not imported by the centralized government purchasing system. Bicycle lanes diminished over time or were taken away and guarded parking and repair shops closed. Uh, bicycling in Havana today, however, there's this continuity because bicycling didn't disappear. Some people did like bicycling for the flexibility, for the freedom, for the exercise, for the experience, and they endeavor to ride. And uh, to put in a plug for uh, our film that we made, it's a 30-minute film called Rodando in La Habana, and I, uh, Bicycle Stories, it's also in the sources. I gave you the, the uh, password in case you'd like to, to watch it. It's a fun film, and also I left a, a link to an article that I did about uh, interviewing women who rode in the special period and how they felt about it. And of course, mostly privation, but also this some experiences of independ becoming, becoming more independent. Young people in particular wanted to ride. And for many young persons, bicycling in the special period was a lot about fun because they were kids. You know, their parents were protecting them from the difficulties and not talking about it as much. And uh, Young people like the freedom and they also see non-Cubans, both Cuban people who come to Cuba as tourists and pe or long-term tourists or expats, um, or, and they also, when they're abroad, see people bicycling and they think of bicycling by choice. And, I, and Mitra's gonna talk about this as well as some other things uh, in a minute. Um, however, bicycling in, in Cuba is currently a luxury because the cost of the bicycle and the challenges of maintenance are significant. With the difficulties of transportation, poor air quality, and lifestyle diseases such as diabetes and heart, condition and heart disease rampant, the Cuban government has agreed in principle to further green transport. 
for instance, they work with NGOs to support rent-a-bike programs. However, they have not implemented large-scale changes such as importing robust bikes to sell at cost or low cost or replacing the bike lanes that were already implemented in the 90s. So on one hand, pandemic mitigation, such as creating the vaccine and stopping people from dying and so forth, has been forefronted, understandably. There's uh, money issues involved. And at the same time, also, activists are vocal about wanting more to be done. And there we have, you can't uh, actually read it, but the pandem I can't complain about the pandemic because thanks to it, I became a bicyclist. You see the bicyclist there, female bicyclist. And I wouldn't change that for anything in the world. That was just sort of traveling around WhatsApp, uh, like C Cuban WhatsApp and Telegram and email. So much of the Cuban leadership, unfortunately, remains de facto captured in the car equals progress logic. And also, unlike many Cubans, many functionaries have easy access to automotive transport. And then at the same time, um, oh, a near exception is Cuba's current president, Miguel Diaz-Canel, fam famed for bicycling. When he worked for the provincial government of Via Clara, he has not been seen bicycling around Havana as president, though we might hope that that could happen, to have a president on a bicycle in Cuba. Cuban leadership, I think, can be criticized for lack of movement on alternative transport. So they have the white paper, but are they putting it in practice? And that said, at the same time, leaders open themselves up to pot shots when they support bicycling. And this is Diario de Cuba, which is online. And so in this article, Miami Cuba right-wingers attack the use of the bicycle in Cuba as evidence of a failing nation state. So we see the era is birthing a bicycle. That bicycle obviously doesn't ride very well. And the critique is in 2013, the transportation is becoming just as bad as it was in the special period, and the evidence of that is the availability of bikes. So again, the, the uh, progress narrative of the car and that being deployed by Miami, Cuba right-wingers to talk about the Cuban government. At the same time, leaders open themselves up to pot shots when they support bicycling. And there, here, this is from the Trevor Noah Daily Show, and it's, uh, it's Fox News and Hannity. So here, U.S. right-wingers attack the use of the bicycle by president as evidence of failing leadership. I thought that parallel was just so incredibly striking, so I thought I'd share it with you. And to return to Havana, Bicycle activism, Mitra will talk about a bit more about Massa Critica there as well, the international mov movement, and in Havana, bicycle art. Here we have Absent Hero. It's the Chinese Forever bicycle on in a tourist uh, area in a restaurant, and this in a uh, in Melia, uh, very decadent, like opulent hotel. Another one, and here at the Fabrica del Arte, which is. Uh, well, it's an art, art and recreational place like dance club and so forth. And just not to talk too much about it, but how, do we, how, how might we understand this art, uh, they're a tribute to the time and to the bicycle and to bicycling. They're a tourist lure because people, especially lefties, were pretty excited about all the bicycling and the agroponicos, um, biological, f I mean, uh, 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 um, organic farms that you know were happening in the Cuba, Cuba in the 90s and and there's also the transnational connections that I'm trying to emphasize of Cuba not being insular right when we see this reminds us of John Lennon and Yoko Ono with their love in and their bicycle the ghost bikes and the white bicycle project of the provost so Cuba could be leading Latin America in non-motorized transportation because it has special period expertise. It has a centralized socialist structure that enables the implementation of widespread change. It has a lack of vested interests in automotive, road, and petrol industry. So a lot of lobby groups, of course, influence what's going on in, um, all over the world. And they are having ever-increasing investment in renewables. Many feel it's time for Cuba to further non-automobile transport as a way to sustainable future 
and as an expression of prosperity rather than uh, as an expression of, of duress or carencia. So it's time to value bicycling as a choice, building upon when bicycling was a necessity. And that's what I have for you except for my sources, and I'll turn it over to Misa. Hi everyone, my name is Mitra Ghaffari. I am a grad student at UC Santa Cruz currently, um, studying social documentation, and I was honored to have a short film screened on the opening night of the conference. Um, and I uh, will piggyback off of Jennifer's wonderful presentation to talk a little bit more about the bike initiatives and main leading advocates of the bicycle in contemporary Cuba. And um, I won't go <laughs> all the way into it, but basically my journey in Cuba started in 2016. I studied abroad there for a year, and the program director of the study abroad program had one bicycle for all of the exchange students to have access to, and no one else wanted to use it. And so it became my bicycle. It's where I fell in love with bicycling, and um, it's how I got to know Cuba initially. Um, I off the bat was working with a few community leaders and, and helped initiate a, a community project in Marianao, uh, Cuba, and it really brought me to a couple of the leaders in the bike community as well. Um, my first school project in Cuba was working with Navis um, and her partner Daylin at Velo Cuba, um, which was the first official um, with a private permit bike shop in Habana Vieja, in basically tourist downtown of Cuba. Um, and Navy Sindelin had a team of primarily uh, women mechanics, um, and they, they uh, really were some of the first advocates, and, and Navy uh, studied engineering and actually was, was given a bicycle as a student during the special period, and that's how um, her bicycle journey got started um, in Cuba was, um, as Jennifer was describing, basically with, with little other transportation options, the government shipped in over a million uh, Chinese bicycles and mainly distributed them as uh, sort of incentives in workplaces and school places um, for, for Cubans to uh, have access to transportation to, to get to those spaces. And there'd be a whole family on one bicycle getting to work in school each day. Um, so uh, I was happy to, to be able to document and work with um, Navis and, and Velo Cuba right off the bat as a student. Um, and that sort of brought me into the bike world in Cuba and I got to know Yasser Gonzalez, which um, is still one of the main bike advocates in Cuba. He brought Masa Critica Critical Mass to Havana um, starting in 2017 and started Cicicleta. And Cicicleta has been doing bike tours um, primarily through Airbnb experience in the last few years. Um, and he's really driven to um, bring the bicycle to the Cuban and not only to the tourist or the foreigner. He was noticing that right off the bat with critical mass, um, there would be about one Cuban to every 10 foreigners or tourists showing up to the rides. Um, and a lot of that has to do with much of the history in Cuba and foreigners' uh, familiarization with the rides and just, you know, uh, associations to the bicycle. Um, so he's been working on how to bring the Cuban into those spaces, how to, as sort of the millennial generation, as the younger generation that were kids during the special period and don't have such a negative association to the bicycle, how to culturally reestablish the bicycle as a more positive symbol um, and a more radical symbol and tool of socioeconomic, you know, uh, transportation instead of having such a, a negative stigma against the bicycle and having it represent the worst of the economic crisis. Um, so uh, another leading figure right now in Cuba's bicycle scene is Gabby, and um, she's sort of the emerging leader in this scene. Um, her background is in um, design and architecture, and so she really looks at uh, 
bicycling and bicycle infrastructure with a placemaking, a creative placemaking lens, and looking at how to, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, sentiment of critical mass, how to take on the streets, how to um, create a space for for the bicycle for bike communities in the streets, um, and what that looks like as far as um, infrastructure and also design and and community building in that in that sense. So there's a whole bunch of uh, actions and initiatives that um, these three and others, Adriana, Ferlan, um, are leading. And a couple notable ones, I mean, a lot of these are, are paralleled to many places um, as far as types of community-rooted uh, bike initiatives. Um, but Gabby and a, a group um, is getting started on doing an oral history project to document um, a whole range of voices and try to collect as and archive as many interviews as possible about people's experiences on bicycles throughout the special period. Um, and then a couple others, um, you know, just through conversation, I was telling Yasser about all of the bike kitchen initiatives and, and what components make up that type of community-oriented uh, mechanics spaces and, and, and shop spaces. And so he immediately started implementing pop-up DIT models for, um, for their shop, especially in the case of... Um, you know, being able to teach Cubans to, to repair their own bicycles, teaching them the skills, making education available, especially in a place where internet's still very costly for local residents. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a lot of courier and, and relief services um, that emerged during the pandemic especially, but even uh, just the sort of environment in Cuba, you know, a part of every, um, bike shop and, and repair shop, there's usually a designated person that is sort of the scavenger and goes all throughout town to find like a missing part or just be able to, to come up with some replacement part for, for the bicycles that they're working with just because uh, bike parts are so limited and, and people are, have to be very resourceful and very inventive with um, parallel to, to what people think about with cars in Cuba. Um, you know, sculpting wooden pedals, coming up with replacement parts that, um, you know, are beyond <laughs> what most people have to, to use uh, for imagining how to keep the bike uh, moving and, and on the road. Um, and so uh, another part of the, the career system was uh, oriented towards, towards helping seniors during the pandemic and that whole um, idea of accessibility to groceries and other uh, material resources. You know, the courier systems in the US, uh, like you go to the grocery store, you drop it off at the house. In Cuba, it's a whole nother level of availability of, of food and, and resources and going all throughout town to like get the eggs <laughs> after a four hour line in one part of, time, uh, one part of town, get the you know, vegetables in another line in another part of town. So the bicycle has proved really useful in this sense. And it was also a, a, an outlet for, for me. I was um, living in Cuba at the start of the pandemic and um, got to escape on my bicycle and, and live on my friend's mango farm. And we kind of created a, a system in the farmlands um, outside of Matanzas in, in a place called Bacunayagua, which is about 80 miles from Havana. And uh, from her mango farm, we were making mango juice and, and distributing mango juice and mangoes and, and chickens live and dead and like all sorts of things to, to local farms in the area just because transportation was largely, um, you know, on pause or, or, or deterred from, um, from Venezuela oil crisis and, and COVID and a whole bunch of things. Um, so, as far as uh, moving forward with, with these uh, um, leaders in the bike initiatives in Cuba, I'm gonna be working with those three and others this summer. Um, as a part of my thesis, I am doing everything bike related, um, trying to document a bit of um, contemporary associations to the bicycle in Cuba and, and how to move forward with them. And so, this is a bit about um, what that process will look like. I'll be doing production this summer. 
And um, along with Gasset and Gabby, we're going to be doing a, an urban photo gallery in conjunction with the Oral History Project to be documenting all types of riders in Havana and all types of utilities of the bicycle. And then we're going to be working with some local artists and, and ironsmiths um, to be doing sculptural bike racks, and that'll be a placemaking component of, of the project. Um, and so we're, we're excited about that. And then um, all of this, the idea is that all of this will launch as a part of an arts and social innovation festival, the fourth annual um, that I have been a part of um, facilitating the last five years, um, just one year that, that it didn't happen because of the pandemic. Um, so that will be in June of, of 23 if you can all make it out to Havana. <laughs> um, so here's contact information for the, the people on uh, the presentation and myself and um, just wanted to you know show everything that's happening, all of the actions despite like the very difficult um, you know accessibility to, to, to bicycle parts and bicycles and and there are many people um, giving like enormous efforts to keep things moving and, and keep people um, actively biking on the island, but there's still so much room for for that to grow and, um, you know, especially during the pandemic and, and all of the uh, ways that the economic impact has deterred people from, from being able to have their fullest access to, to bicycling. So, thank you. <laughs> Perhaps the person who's coming in via Zoom can introduce themselves. Hello. Hello. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, I'm not I'm having not access, to, access the to the video. I cannot, I cannot turn, it, turn on. it on. Could you enable, Could you enable the access to the video? Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, um, so, um, I am Megumi Yamanaka. Yamanaka. I will be, be sharing my PowerPoint, my PowerPoint, but this is, this is um, all of it. Could, could you could enable, you enable um, um, to, share to share the screen? The screen? You're, you're all good. We can hear you and everything, so you're ready. If you have a slide, uh, you can share them with us also. But you're, you're all good. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Okay, so okay, I so am a PhD, PhD candidate, candidate at the University, at the University, University of California, California Berkeley. Berkeley. I will be sharing a research that I've been conducting about gender differences in bicycle use in Latin American cities. So why is it important to consider gender differences? Historically, gender differences have been overlooked in bicycle infrastructure planning. And recent studies suggest that women are more risk averse than men. Therefore, Therefore, women's, women's cycling, cycling rights often reflect cycling, 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 cycling safety, safety levels, levels of, of cities. cities. Also, also, women tend women to engage in more household cycling activities, activities and child care. Thus, women, women often travel, travel with a lot of passengers. Passenger. 
which could which be could a barrier, be a barrier to cycling in less bike friendly cities. cities. And, and oh, I'm sorry, I'm I will sorry, turn, off turn off my off my, my microphone. microphone. Oh, could you, oh, could turn, you turn off the microphone, the microphone Kevin? Kevin? Uh, I see uh, that, I see uh, that uh, the microphone of the, the room, room is it's on, on and that and should that be turned turn off. off. Hello? Hello? Okay, so I will so continue. I will continue. Um, um so, so if, if women and women elderly cycling rates are significantly lower than men and younger, and younger people, people it means it that means cycling environments do not satisfy the vulnerable people's requirements, requirements. after identifying after current problems, problems cycling environments need to be improved, improved. and, and <coughs> Okay, the okay, second. second. And, and so why so Latin, why America? Latin America? Urbanization, Urbanization in Latin, in Latin America, America began to began increase in the second of the 20th, 20th century, century to reach to nearly 80% of the population, of the population a, large a large migration of rural, of rural inhabitants. inhabitants. I, I see I that see the that physical, physical room, room there, there, the laptop, the laptop that, that placed, placed in the room, in the room um, the, microphone the microphone of the laptop, 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 laptop is on. on. That, that should be turned, should be turned off. off. Could you somebody, Could you somebody turn, turn off the, off the microphone, microphone of, of the, the room? The room of the laptop. Of the laptop? Hello. Ah, okay. Finally. <laughs> okay, I will continue. And so <clears throat> some pioneering cities like Bogota and Santiago have done major bicycle infrastructure investments, and the bicycle use is rapidly increasing in those places. Despite the increase of bike lanes, women continue to be a minor portion of total bicycle users. Despite existing gender gap, Latin America is still an understudied region. Okay. So this is a comparison table of different regions in the world in terms of cycling. At the left, there are Netherlands, Denmark, Japan, and Germany, the best countries in cycling mode share and gender equality in cycling. At the middle, there are the US, UK, and Australia, the countries with lower cycling rates and greater gender gap in cycling. At the right, there are Latin American countries that are also characterized by lower cycling rates and greater gender gap in cycling. The UK, US, Australia, and Latin American countries share similar characteristics, low rates of cycling, lower proportion of female and elderly cyclists, people like occasional, people bike occasionally as recreation or exercise, and there are higher rates of cyclists, fatalities, and injuries. In contrast, in Netherlands, Denmark, Japan, Germany, cycling rates are higher, and a small or no differences among women and men, and also among age groups in cycling, people bike regularly as a habit in everyday life. Also, they are characterized by lower rates of cyclists, fatalities, and injuries. This is a graph that shows how overall mode share of cycling is related to the proportion of cycle trips made by females. We can see that mode share of cycling is positively correlated to, with the proportion of cycle trips made by females. As mode share of cycling increases, the proportion of cycle trips made by females increases. So we can see here the group of uh, these European countries, Netherlands, Denmark, Japan, and Germany have higher mode share of cycling and also 
the proportion of cycle trips made by females are higher, nearly 50% or more than 50%. And in terms of the US, UK, Australia, that are these yellow color groups, uh, they have small portion of mode share of cycling and the proportion of cycle trips made by females are also low. And in Latin America, also we can see a lower mode share of cycling and lower proportion of cycle trips by females. So Jan Garrard argues in her book, uh, Cycling for Sustainable Cities, uh, one chapter of the book, she wrote that a woman's cycling rate is often an indicator of bicycle friendliness. So if we provide greater protection for cyclists, the proportion of female cyclists will increase and ultimately overall cycling mode share will increase. And these are the study areas that um, we covered. Uh, six metropolitan areas of Latin America, starting from Mexico City, followed by Bogota, Asuncion, Santiago, Sao Paulo, and Buenos Aires. These are the data sources, uh, which are mostly origin destination survey data. All data except for the Asuncion survey were provided by local statistical or transportation institutions. In the case of Asuncion, I carried out the survey during, team, during the month of July 2018 to 2,200 people with the students of National University of Asuncion. This is the map of bike lane network of each city. Red color indicates exclusive bike lanes and in Bogota, Santiago, Sao Paulo, there are more exclusive uh, bike lanes. And in Asuncion, uh, exclusive bike lanes are very limited. These maps are the streets classified according to the slope. Slopes greater or equal to 6% are uh, colored uh, in magenta, and slopes greater than 6% are in co blue color. Sao Paulo is a hilliest city, followed by Bogota, Mexico, and Santiago. And Asuncion, Buenos Aires are pretty uh, mostly flat. In the next several slides, I will be showing travel behavior of people in the six cities in Latin America about the use of bicycle and other transport modes. This is a proportion of total trips by gender in each city. In all graphs, blue is men and red is women for this entire presentation. In some cities, as, as, as Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo, men travel more, and in the rest of cities, women travel more. This is the total trips, including all modes of transportation. Uh, this is a proportion of work trips by gender of each city. Work trips are all trips related to work or in the case of students, it is related to study. In all cities except Asuncion, men make the most work-related trips. In contrast, in case of non-work trips, um, women make most part of the trips. So in Santiago, Mexico City, Bogota, Buenos Aires, uh, women make considerably more non-work trips. This is a modern share of work trips in each city. Motorized modes are on the left side, transit, car, motorcycle, taxi, and non-motorized modes are on the right side, bicycle and walking. And in, in all the cities, uh, they are in this order. So motorized modes <coughs> are mostly used by men. Men travel more frequently by car, motorcycle, and bicycle, and women travel more frequently by transit, taxi, and walking. And this is a modern share of no work trips in each city. The proportion of transit considerably decreases for no work trips compared to work trips. We can see the previous slide, work trips, the amount of transit travels they are much higher than non-work trips. So it means that 
um, people choose to go to closer destinations to avoid the use of transit. And also it may represent a barrier for those who, don't, who do not have a car. In Bogota, Buenos Aires, Mexico City and Santiago, the number of walking trips increased. So the number of walking trips increased compared to work trips. We can see work trips and these were non-work trips and mainly women's work trips, non-work trips increased. These are the cities, these four cities, Bogota, Buenos Aires, Mexico City and Santiago, where, uh, where women make considerably more non-work trips. So the gender gap in non-work non trips were greater in these four cities, according to the previous graph. And these are the activity types of non-work trips in each city. We have household care activities, social and recreation activities, health and shopping. Shopping consists mainly uh, grocery shopping. Um, so in general, women do more household care, health and shopping trips. In cities with greater gender gap in non-work trips, these four cities, Bogota, Buenos Aires, Mexico City and Santiago, uh, this difference is greater in these three items, shopping, health, and household care activities. In conclusion, uh, women tend to make more non-work trips than men, particularly for household care, health, and shopping activities, and women travel more frequently in transit, taxi, and walking, which are sustainable transport modes, while men travel more frequently by car, motorcycle, and bicycle. Men prefer to, to uh, travel as drivers compared to women that prefer to be passengers or to walk. And also women do a greater amount of household care, health and shopping trips. It is not worthy that in cities with greater gender gap in non-work trips, this difference is greater. The gender stereotype might be creating these gender differences. In the next slides, I will be showing bicycle model share by gender in the six cities. These are bicycle model shares with respect to total trips. Cities with greater amount of bicycle infrastructure, such as Bogota, Santiago, have a higher rate of bicycle trips. This is the proportion of female and male bicycle work trips. We can see that cities with greater amount of bicycle infrastructure and lower slopes have less gender gap in work trips. By, uh, Buenos Aires, for example, have lower slopes and Santiago and Bogota have greater amount of bicycle network. And this is the same as the previous, but for non-work trips. In general, non-work bicycle trips tend to have less gender gap than work trips. We can compare with work trips that have greater gender gap and in non-work trips have less gender gap. This might be because women simply make more non-work trips than men based on the previous slide. So in conclusion, based on our data, we confirm that men are considerably more likely to use bicycle than women in this region. And cities with better cycling environments with greater amount of bicycle infrastructure and fewer slope seem to have less gender gap in bicycle trips not only built environment, but topography slope is also important. In the next slides, I will be showing what are socioeconomic and physical environment factors that influence bicycling. So in terms of socioeconomic factors, we identified two groups of people who tend to never use a bicycle in this region. First, vulnerable, vulnerable people in terms of safety on public roads which are women and the elderly. The second group consists of those with higher income and higher educational attainment. And the people who are most likely to ride a bicycle are mostly men under 60 years old, occupied in terms of employment, low income and less or equal to primary educational level. So lower educational level. Another socioeconomic factor is that 
elderly women are similarly uh, significantly less likely to use bicycle than elderly men. Among the elderly, gender gap is greater. Also, the gender gap among the elderly is even greater for non-work bike trips compared to work bike trips. Men with a college level educational attainment are significantly less likely to use bicycle, but for women, this trend was not observed. The bicycle image issue is detected only among men. And among the physical environment factors, uh, the greater amount of bike lanes near home are positively associated with bicycle use. For women, this effect is greater. So continuous bicycle network is even more important for women. And greater road lengths and slopes are negatively associated with bicycle use. So more road lengths and more slopes reduce bicycle use. In conclusion, uh, based on the lower cycling rates of women and elderly, current cycling infrastructures seem not satisfying their safety requirements in this region. And um, continuous low stress bike network protecting from vehicle traffic, which provides a safe and comfortable transportation experience, enabling women and elderly to get where they want to go is needed. And since in, in Latin America, higher income men are not using bicycle, campaigns to improve the image of cycling and to promote cycling to build a cycling habit are critical and also promotions of e-bikes to overcome slopes are important since topography is a major obstacle for cyclists, especially for women. So that's all. Thank you very much for my presentation and uh, uh, for attending the presentation and I will stop sharing. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Carl Bike, for your invitation um, and this important space. Uh, it's a pleasure to me and my team uh, to be here. Um, my name is Lorena Romero. I hold a degree as a project manager and as an international business professional. Uh, I'm the director of um, BC Activa Foundation and currently I'm working at IDEPAC 
which is the Participation Institute of Bogota. Uh, my work uh, in this institute is being the leader of sustainable mobility. Um, y quiero, pues, eh, hablarles un poco de por qué uso la bicicleta. I'd like to talk a little bit about why I ride a bicycle. Um, crecí viendo a mi familia en las carreras de ciclismo profesionales, llenar los carros eh, en los viajes con nuestras bicicletas cuando, bueno, íbamos a viajar. Y cuando fui a la universidad fue el único medio de transporte que me permitía llegar a tiempo. I grew up in a family uh, of professional cyclists going to races. Uh, we would fill our cars with the bicycles when we went out to travel. And when I went to college, that was the only uh, mode of transportation that would allow me to get where I was going on time. Um, tuve por años unas complicaciones cardíacas, unos problemas cardíacos y una operación que me hizo abandonar los entrenamientos de patinaje. And uh, for years, I had some complications, some heart problems, and surgery that made me quit uh, the training I was doing in skating. Um, desde que empecé a usar la bicicleta, esta se convirtió no solo en mi medicina, sino también en el medio para conocer gente, viajar, eh, conocer realmente mi ciudad, y quería que todos, en especial las mujeres, empezaran a usar la bicicleta. Since I started riding bicycles, uh, it became not just uh, a medicine for me, but also a way of getting to know people, of traveling, and, and really becoming familiar with my own city. And uh, in particular, I wanted everybody, but, but especially women, um, to also start to ride bicycles. En Bogotá y en general, eh, en Colombia, al igual que yo, muchos tuvimos una experiencia muy cercana a la bicicleta toda nuestra vida. In, in Bogota and in Colombia in general, um, just like me, many of us uh, had a very intimate experience with bicycles um, throughout our whole life. Crecemos sabiendo que nuestros ciclistas son los mejores del mundo, viendo nuestros abuelos, padres, familia y amigos usar la bicicleta por la ciclovía, eh, hacer mercado, llevar a los niños al colegio, eh, ir a trabajar, a la universidad, a cine. Vemos a los campesinos llevando sus cosechas, pedimos domicilios que llevan en bicicleta. En todo lugar y en todo momento siempre tenemos una bicicleta que cuenta la historia con nosotros. We grow up knowing that our cyclists are the best in the world. We see our grandparents, uh, our parents, uh, the whole family of friends riding bicycles uh, out on the ciclovías, um, going shopping, uh, taking the kids to school, uh, biking to work, uh, biking to college, out to the movies. Um, we see uh, in the rural areas uh, people uh, bringing the harvest in on bicycles. Um, people ordering food uh, that gets delivered on bicycles to their houses. Uh, for every memorable moment in life, there's always a bicycle there to help tell the story. Um, in Colombia, existe un importante movimiento eh, de base en torno a la bicicleta. In Colombia, there's a very large grassroots movement around bicycling. Bogotá cuenta con una presencia importante de activistas que desde hace eh, muchos años pues trabajan en, en la ciudad. Uh, there's a large activist movement um, that in Bogota um, that has um, started and been growing um, for quite a number of years. Um, desde los años 70, Bogota eh, es una ciudad desarrollada en torno y en función del automóvil. Ha tenido hitos muy interesantes, en eh, pero ha tenido hitos muy interesantes en torno a la promoción y al uso de la bicicleta. Uh, Bogota is a city that was developed uh, around the car, uh, but since the 70s, uh, it's promoted bicycling in a very big way. Las dos ruedas hacen parte de nuestra cultura, tanto deportiva como recreativa y de movilidad. Este importante biciactivismo del que Biciactivo hace parte ha logrado articularse con el gobierno de la ciudad. Two-wheel transportation uh, is part of our culture, uh, not just uh, in sports, but in recreation and general mobility. And uh, the bicycle activism that BC Activa is a part of has uh, achieved a lot of success with the government of the city. Iniciativas ciudadanas se han convertido en políticas públicas y han permanecido en el tiempo. Tenemos una serie de hitos importantes, pero en este momento me quiero centrar en dos. 
community initiatives have become public policy and have taken root. And we have um, quite a few achievements, but at, at this moment I'd like to focus on just two. Eh, la ciclovía, en primer lugar, que tiene actualmente 48 años y 128 kilómetros o 79 millas, eh, en la capital de mi país, desde hace casi cinco décadas, las principales vías de la ciudad se peatonalizan y se convierten en un gran espacio para las bicicletas. Vías de tres y, y seis eh, carriles libres de tráfico automotor se convierten en un espacio de recreación, convivencia y aprendizaje eh, y de movilidad. Uh, the ciclovía uh, has been around in our capital city for 48 years. There are 128 kilometers or 79 miles uh, of a bicycle network um, throughout the city um, for the past five decades. The main avenues of the city are closed off uh, to cars and become a space uh, for bicycles and lanes that. Uh, 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 streets that have three or six lanes uh, are free of automobile traffic and are a uh, space for recreation, community, learning, and mobility. Imaginen por un momento a Columbus, a, eh, Columbus Avenue, eh, acá en, pues, bueno, en San Francisco, libre de cualquier vehículo eh, automotor y lleno de personas en bicicleta, patines, trotando y paseando en familia y con sus amigos. Imagine for a moment uh, Columbus Avenue right here in San Francisco, free of motor vehicle traffic, full of bicycles, people skating, jogging, or just out for a stroll with the family or friends. De manera sistemática, casi todos los domingos y festivos del año se liberan en Bogotá las principales calles de automóviles y esta dinámica ahora hace parte del patrimonio de los bogotanos. Por otra parte, Bogotá tiene una importante red de ciclorrutas con más de 560 kilómetros o 348 millas de extensión. Uh, every Sunday, uh, the uh, main avenues uh, throughout Bogotá um, and also on, on holidays are closed off uh, to automobiles. And uh, this, this space has become a very important uh, part of the heritage of the local people of Bogotá. There's also a very large uh, network of bicycle lanes throughout the city um, with 560 kilometers or 348 miles uh, of in the network. Pero así como las iniciativas eh, así como hay iniciativas de grupos de activistas en la ciudad, hay espacios de participación consagrados en la ley y en la administración distrital. Los consejos locales y distrital de la bicicleta, programas como al colegio en bici, al trabajo en bici, escuelas de la bici, rutas seguras que acompañan a los ciclistas en los picos de montaña, con ejército y policía nacional, entre otros, no nacieron de las administraciones ni de ningún alcalde. Realmente nacieron de los ciclistas que por décadas han pedido eh, por su dinámica cultural, más y mejores programas para usar medios alternativos de transporte y para solventar la falta de metro de un buen sistema de transporte público, de infraestructura vial que reduzca los tiempos de tránsito. But even so, uh, there are initiatives um, that come from the activists in the city. Um, these uh, are uh, engage, uh, mechanisms for engagement that are codified in, lo in law. Uh, and they're called the bicycle local and district bicycle boards um, that have created programs like uh, bike to school, bike to work, uh, uh, safe routes, uh, the police and army patrol, the mountains surrounding the city to make them safe for cyclists, uh, among other programs. And, and all, these, uh, all these initiatives did not come from the government itself, um, from any mayor, but They were born out of the cyclists themselves uh, that have been advocating for decades for a more dynamic uh, cultural and, and better programs uh, for using alternative means of transportation and to solve the lack of uh, metro service, um, to create a better uh, public system of transportation and reduce transit times. En Colombia hemos demostrado que el biciactivismo se, se puede convertir en política pública y que la política pública se puede convertir en biciactivismo. En Colombia hemos demostrado que el activismo biciactivismo puede convertirse en política pública 
and pol public policy can become bicycle activism. Claro, el interés político, la creación de políticas públicas, el seguimiento de entidades de control y corporaciones como el Consejo de Bogotá facilitan que, la ciudad cada día, eh, que en la ciudad cada día sean más y más los ciclistas. Pero realmente es una apuesta ciudadana la que nos ha puesto como referente de la bicicleta en Latinoamérica. Of course, uh, public, uh, political interest um, and the creation of public policy uh, oversight by government entities Uh, for example, the Bogota City Council has all helped uh, create a city where there are more and more cyclists. Um, but it's really the community that has created uh, uh, this uh, environment in, um, as a this environment uh, in, in Bogota. Yo me sumé al 5% de viajes que hace años se tomaba en la ciudad a pedalazos. Hoy ya somos aproximadamente 8%, todavía las mujeres somos minoría, siendo el 24.2%, eh, cuando los hombres son el 75.8%. Así como fui parte y apoyé la creación del segundo consejo local de la bicicleta de, de la ciudad. Uh, I joined the 5% of uh, trips uh, years ago that are taken on bicycle in the city. Um, it's now approximately 8% of all trips um, that are taken on bicycle. Um, women are still a minority, about 24.2% compared to the 75.8% of men. Um, and I, I supported the creation of the second local bicycle board in the city. Hace seis años éramos solamente diez personas en dos consejos locales de la bicicleta en Bogotá. Estos espacios que proponen, asesoran, articulan desde lo local hasta lo distrital. Todos los temas de política pública y de actividades en torno a la movilidad sostenible. Ahora son 18 los consejos que tiene la ciudad y más o menos eh, 80 personas que lo conforman. Just six years ago, there were two local bicycle boards in Bogota with only 10 people in total. Uh, these boards are a mechanism for community members to examine public policy around sustainable mobility and formulate initiatives from local to district levels. Uh, now there are 18 boards uh, throughout the city with about 80 people total as members. Antes la ciudad tenía alrededor de 20 organizaciones sociales que trabajábamos por incentivar el uso de la bicicleta y ahora somos eh, alrededor de 130 que estamos caracterizadas. Uh, the city used to have 20 non-profits um, that worked like Bici Activa to incentivize bicycling and now there are 130. Hoy seguimos siendo la única radio, eh, el único medio de comunicación comunitario hecho por ciclistas de la ciudad y queremos seguir contando esas historias que hacen parte de Bogotá eh, y que hacen que Bogotá sea una de las capitales mundiales de la bicicleta. Pero uh, Bici Activa es still la única community radio station run by cyclists in the city and we want to continue telling the stories that make Bogotá one of the bicycle capitals of the world. Um, bicycling is a big part of the future. That is why Invisi Activa uh, considers that bikes are an essential tool for our emancipation. Uh, when we are biking, we know we create culture and happiness. Thank you so much. I I have uh, a video, a last video.
pastors of P pastors for peace out of New York to help students and we focus on Oakland of course to help Oakland students uh, go to medical school in Cuba and there's been a number of um, Oakland graduates who have actually gone to medical school um, and they have to promise to work in community-based hospitals or clinics for like five years or so to because their education is, is free. Also, I've been to Cuba about three times, and I'm sad to hear that things are going down with respect to bicycling. Um, I did never see women on bicycles. I only saw men or boys. and But I did see a lot of uh, curbside um, bicycle mechanics who fix your bicycles and could fix really anything. So I hope that that is still going on in Cuba. And I hope to see... Um, more bicycle advocates in Cuba. Um, it's a great, it's a beautiful place and more infrastructure because some of the roads are kind of torn up. But thank you for your presentations. I really enjoyed it. Hey, I don't know if this is working. Oh, great. Uh, hey, uh, I'm. Uh, just curious, I, I actually didn't hear the last presentation. I was on a meeting outside, so apologies if you uh, talked about this in your presentation. But I was curious to know if you all had uh, witnessed any of the process of uh, bi developing bicycle lanes or bicycle infrastructure in um, the countries that you've visited or, or lived in, um, and how that process, how we might learn from that process in the states, if that differs, if you feel like there was a, a democratic process that also was more conducive to, to developing uh, bicycle infrastructure. Um, bueno, en Bogotá realmente durante muchos años han desarrollado Em, in, eh, infraestructura y ciclorutas para los para los ciclistas durante muchos años. Uh, Bogotá has been developing uh, the ciclovías, the bicycle lanes, um, for many years. Uh, pero últimamente, en los últimos años, desde la administración pasada, es decir, unos seis años, eh, desde hace seis años, se crea una infraestructura no segregada. Eh, no solo para los ciclistas, es decir, no está como dentro del de andén, eh, el espacio de los peatones, sino se le quita espacio al carro. Uh, but in the last uh, six years, um, starting with the last administration, um, the, the government has um, started creating bicycle lanes um, that's uh, not uh, 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 separate from the street, it's not on the sidewalks, uh, Rather, it's in the street and um, cordoning off space, um, taking space away from the cars. Entonces, pues, una calle normal, eh, por el uso masivo de los ciclistas, salen tantos ciclistas, que en una calle normal, simplemente lo que hacen ahora es dividir, segregar para los ciclistas, pero es una calle normal. Entonces, esto facilita que por costos eh, y, pues, también para que el tráfico de los ciclistas sea mucho más fácil, no tienes como que subir, tener obstáculos, sino simplemente vas en un recorrido mucho más práctico también para el ciclista. Y ahorra costos para la administración, entonces hace que sean muchos más los espacios. Y el hecho de que se usa en la calle, hace que sea mucho más fácil para los ciclistas. Hay mucho más espacio for for bicycling it's more practical uh, it also reduces cost y pues bueno realmente como ha sido eh, tanto el aumento de ciclistas de 5% hace 6 años ahora a casi el doble algo más de 8% pues eso hace que pues realmente primero hayan muchos ciclistas pero los ciclistas demanden más vías uh, and the uh, bicycling has increased uh, from 5% um, six years ago to um, reaching uh, almost twice that, more than 8% now. Um, so there are a lot more um, cyclists and there are a lot more people, um, you know, bicyclists demanding more as well. 
Y por último, en 2018 eh, se crea la ley Provisi en Colombia, que es la ley 1811, que no solo le brinda un carril segregado al ciclista, sino le permite eh, usar y ser la prioridad eh, en la vía. Es decir, un ciclista puede usar una vía normal para los carros y tiene la prioridad eh, y segundo, eh, puede usarla, puede ir por la mitad del carril y el carro debe esperar hasta que pueda sobrepasarlo. Uh, and there is also a new law, uh, a bicycling law, uh, called uh, the law 1811, um, that uh, not only creates the um, bicycle uh, lanes in the street, but also gives bicycles the right of way. So bicycles can use, by law, um, cars, lanes, and, and they have uh, priority. Y pues eso hace que finalmente todas las vías sean para los ciclistas, aunque no estén segregadas. Um, and so all the streets now can be used by um, bicyclists. They don't have to be segregated. I wanted to just speak to quickly about Bogota. There was also this, the famous strong mayor that put in the, um, the uh, yes. Um, uh, well, we're, we're getting a no sh uh, motion that we need to wrap up. So, but I did want to uh, say that the strong mayor made a big difference in creating the Ciclovia, which I think speaks to your question because Cuba was, you know, they were under duress in the 90s, but they also have a centralized, and they also have a centralized government. So they basically just saw a need and, and did it. And the, I think the bigger question that you maybe were asking is like, in times of big crisis, in how far do we need to have, should we, it, would it behoove us to have a centr more central government, which is interesting in our pseudo-democracy because there's a tension going on there also about the individual, the rights of the individual and the rights of society because there's the equity issue because seemingly rich people are more individual than people who are not rich, right? Some pigs are more equal than others. Um, should we stop? And you'll talk to us outside because we're getting... To, I guess we're running into the neck. We started late, so. All right, thank you so much.